like this, brother, from the get-go. For the very first time we met. So, anyway. Today's scripture reading is in Philippians 4. 4 through 7. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Be let your gentleness be evidence to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. So be it. Many of you know this is not my comfort zone. <laughs> oh. um. uh. I just wanted to ask if you've thought about with this season coming what some of your most memorable Christmases were or are to you. I have two of them I'd like to share with you. Um, after going through a certain amount of disciplines, I wasn't expecting much for Christmas. <laughs> and I was surprised. I was maybe somewhere between 8 and 10. I received an electric train and an erector set. But what made it a real Christmas is my dad got on his hands and knees and played with me more than once. And uh, made me understand that our misunderstandings didn't remove the love we had for each other. The second one was about a year, a little over a year. No, not quite a year after Barb and I were married. She got a letter from her grandma stating that her grandma requested her brother to bring her a Christmas tree. And Barb knew right away that this was her last Christmas because she hadn't had a tree for a decade or so. And she was quite broken about it. We were in, in the middle of about an 18 month, what turned out to be an 18 month layoff and things were pretty tight with four land payments. And, but we had a little bit and my I had called my dad a couple weeks earlier, and well, I called him every weekend, but he had said if we could make it back there, he would give us gas money to get back here. So we took off with an old 72 rusted out Maverick and in the middle of winter and headed back without telling anyone. And we drove in by my folks, and Dad was decorating a tree outside. He was just about kicking his chin the time we got parked, because he couldn't believe it. And we made the same surprise to her family, and especially her grandmother. She was poor of hearing, so he just walked in. I had a a beard at that time and I knew she hadn't seen me before with a beard and she stopped dead in her tracks and turned and went the other way <laughs> I thought I scared her 
And she said, no, I wanted to get my glasses. I couldn't believe my eyes. So it leads me to say that Christmas is not about us. It's about the love that we're supposed to pass on that God showed us. If you'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you, we love you, we adore you because you love and adore us. Father, as we do approach Christmas season, help us to remember that Jesus is the reason for everything, the reason that we have life and breath and that he has called us to follow after him in his footsteps, obedient to his leadership because he is the head and the authority of us in the church that we are a bunch of different parts brought together, organized, completely different, to bring unity to the body, to build up and to tell others about Jesus Christ. And as we approach the Christmas season, Lord, may we also realize that we're in a world of hurt that de so desperately needs Jesus. May we remember the times that we've had the good Christmases, but let us also long to, to have a... Good Christmas now by sharing the gospel message, by, by showing one another love, whether it comes in the form of grieving with them or, or lifting them up. May we remember our families and friends, but may we also remember the world because Jesus Christ came and was born so that He could give His life for this world. We thank You and praise You for Your Word. We thank You for the opportunity that we have to worship and praise You and come together. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you don't have one, be sure you still get a copy of this daily bread. It's got 10 devotions leading up to Christmas. So guess what? <laughs> Today is day one of that, if, so you haven't missed one yet at all. And it starts out with talking about being home alone, the movie Home Alone. That's not the first uh, devotion, but it's the first thing that's mentioned. And how sometimes we think that, oh yeah, we can face this world and it might be great to be all alone and everything else. But see, God never meant for that to be. He didn't design us that way. He designed us to be in a relationship with Him so that we could be in a relationship with others. A right relationship with Him so that we could be in a right relationship with others. And that's why Jesus spread His arms out and said, come to me. I give my life for you. That's what Christmas is all about. And today we lit the joy candle. And I looked up a couple definitions to see what the joy means. And I looked up from a biblical perspective. And I got some contradicting things. But then I got thinking about it. I'm like, they're not really contradicting. Um, from BibleStudyTools.com, it says that joy is the happiness over an unanticipated or present good. And then it goes on to talk about that it's fundamental to understand the Old Testament so that you could see the New Testament and God's love fulfilled there in Jesus Christ. But that word unanticipated caught my thought process. Is the joy that we have unanticipated? I mean, all Scripture speaks out and tells of a Messiah of God's love, and Jesus is the manifestation of that. Then I read on another website, patheos.com, that joy isn't like... Happiness, which is based upon happenings, or whether things are going well or not, no joy remains even amidst suffering. Oh, this is sounding a lot more like the New Testament, maybe even the Old Testament. Joy is not happiness. Joy is an emotion that's acquired by the anticipation of something. So I've got anticipation and unanticipated. Well, we can anticipate that God loves us, but who would have ever anticipated that He would give His only Son to die for us, that we could be reconciled? That's the foolishness of this message of the cross. How in the world could God love us that much? But He does. That's what Christmas is all about. 
And I will remind again that, that you may have good Christmases that you remember. You may have bad Christmases that you remember. But there's pain and suffering in this world. And they need to see the love of Jesus Christ through us. We need to remember the reason for the season. Not everybody thinks Christmas is the greatest time of year. Some people do, some people don't. There are people hurting out there, relationships hurting. They need to know that God loves them unconditionally. That Christ's death on the cross was good enough for every sin, for every person, for all eternity. That nothing can separate me from God's love through Jesus Christ. So those definitions work. I can see them. I could never, even though I anticipated it so much, have expected, it was unanticipated that God would love me so much that He would send His Son to die for me. That if I simply believe, not clean up my act first, anything else, not be equipped with all these different things of my own talents and abilities, but the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord would be sufficient for all time. And that then He would seal me with His Spirit, equip me to do what I could never, ever do on my own. Does that mean that I have finished with sin? <laughs> Paul's clear about that. No, I'm not. But I am totally, 100% forgiven child of God. Wow! What a time to rejoice and be merry at Christmas. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 2.9, which we've been studying in 1 Corinthians. He says, However it is written, however... Whatever you think about the message of the cross being foolish or the wisdom that you have, it is written, as it is written, applying the Old Testament, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived. What is that? The things God has prepared for those who love Him. So now applying what I just talked about, about joy, and the things that you can think about and think that heaven will be like, what a wonderful place, and you can think of all the scriptures and everything else, guess what? You don't have a clue what God has in store for you. You might have just this much. Maybe you have this much. But what God has planned for you, no mind can conceive, no thought can ever process. If this same God loved you enough that He would send His Son to die for you, that you could be reconciled, what in the world do you think heaven's going to be like? Whatever you think, it will be so many more times than that. Paul is quoting Isaiah 64, 4 here, which says, Since ancient times no one has ever heard, nor ear has perceived, no, no eye has seen, any God besides you, it's all about God and His love for us. The God who acts on behalf of those who wait for Him. And Scripture's clear, the reason that we're waiting for Him is because He doesn't want any man to not be able to come to Him, but all to come to Him. So He is patiently waiting until the last one comes. And we have an obligation and a privilege and a right and a responsibility to tell others of the hope that we have, the joy that we have in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 9 continues with verse 10. It says, These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. Let the Spirit lead you, guide you, speak to you. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after God as you lean to His Spirit. Joy is something that can only be experienced, truly experienced by the Spirit of God because He has revealed those things to us. Anything else in this world where you try to find joy, you will find out that it's not. It will let you down. But God will never forsake you. He is true. He is holy. He is righteous. And praise be to God that He is so. There are several words that, that describe joy in the New Testament. And one of those talks about leaping. And I want to talk about that briefly. And we find that in, in Luke chapter 1. But before we go to Luke, because I've been continuing to read Luke if you haven't noticed. And Luke is what the um, daily bread starts out with in the first devotion. I want to go back to the Old Testament again, to the book of Isaiah, seven to eight hundred years before Jesus was born. So much accuracy and detail and prophecy there that, that a lot of experts, quote unquote, think that Isaiah was written by 
several authors. Because how could all this information be so accurate and so true? But we see that Paul quotes Isaiah. If we read the Gospels, we see that Isaiah is quoted over and over and over again. So if we go back to Isaiah chapter 35, and if you have an NIV, it says, Joy of the redeemed is a header. And here's what we read in Isaiah 35. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice. Catch that word rejoice. That's another word for joy. And blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. Look at the, the rejoice and the joy given there. and Look at the actions that come from that. The, the blossoming, the bursting into bloom, the shouting. James says, show me your faith without deeds, right? We see the same correlation again. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. It's a gift. It's not something we get again. It's given to you by God through His Spirit because of Jesus Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. The glory of Lebanon, Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Now maybe Isaiah is just talking about salvation from Babylon here, but let's read on. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's foretelling about something greater. Verse 3 says, Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. First advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save us. Well, wait a minute. Is there some first advent and second advent maybe in there? Maybe he's talking about Babylon? I don't know. Okay, let's go on. Verse 5 says, Then... While the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Sounding more and more like Jesus here, isn't it, in that first advent? Verse 6, Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Because God has fulfilled His promises in Jesus Christ coming. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. Now pay attention what comes next. Verse 8, And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. What did, what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one whatsoever comes to God except through me. The Christians first were accused of following the way. Before they were called Christians or anything, they were believers in the way. <laughs> and Isaiah wrote about it seven or eight hundred years before Christ. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools, a quote that Paul gives again, the foolishness, the fools out there will not go about on it. No lion will be there, no, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. Maybe we're talking about Jesus' first coming again now. Maybe we're talking about the second coming. Just think about what you have, the joy that you have through Jesus Christ, however you read this scripture. But only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing everlasting joy. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Everlasting lasting joy with God the Father for all eternity. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. We know there will be a day when all of our tears are dried where there will be no more suffering, no more death. Now that's what Isaiah wrote that most all skeptics can agree was penned by Isaiah because they uh, pretty much all agree on that. But then if we skip a few chapters in, we're going to get into where some experts say, maybe Isaiah didn't write this. How could he write this? Well, he could because God inspired it to him through the Holy Spirit. So if we skip to Isaiah 40 and read the first 11 verses, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. Sounds like Babylon here. That her sins has been paid for. Well, wait a minute. Now it's not sounding like Babylon again. Because <laughs> we're just going to sin again and again. We can't pay the penalty that we have for our sins. Our penalty for our sins, the wages of sin, is death. 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So maybe he's tr switching here to talking about Jesus. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all our sin. Now wait a minute, double all of her sins? Well, Jesus clearly told us that he paid the price. He, he not only paid the price, I don't care how great your sins are, how great your insecurities are, he paid the debt and it's been paid in full and no matter what you do, he's even doubled it. You will never out sin Jesus' love on that cross. Never, ever. Verse 3, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Sound a lot like John the Baptist here, isn't it? In fact, I think Scripture quotes this again. Verse 4, Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged place a plain. That way is being mapped out for us. It was mapped out for us through Jesus Christ. But it's a narrow way. It's a path that few follow. The gate is small. Few find it. But that gift has been given to all who will accept it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 5, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All people are like grass, and their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Praise be to the Gideons in their work because every time that the word of God is handed out there, it will endure. It will not come back void. Verse 9, You who bring good news to Zion, go up on, on the high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift up and do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, Here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and He rules with a mighty arm. See His reward is with Him. Now we're getting to the book of Revelation, aren't we? With some of Jesus' last words. Behold my... Well, after He's been to heaven, some of His last words in our testament, that He will be coming. Because John was revealed these things that had to come so that we would know that we wouldn't lose heart, that we would have the faith. And His recompense accompanies Him. That all men will be held accountable for even the thoughts that they've done. But those who believe in Jesus Christ will be completely covered by the blood of the Lamb. Better than any snow can ever cover the ground. Completely, totally covered with a robe of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ. Now these words were penned, well there's verse 11, let me say it. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. These words were penned many years before Jesus Christ. But can you not see Jesus in here? Can you not see God's love, His fulfillment of His promises, that His word stands true, that you can trust every single one so that you can have hope, love, joy and peace that only Jesus Christ can give. So have your sins been paid for? Are you anxiously awaiting the return of Jesus Christ to carry you home? And are you living? Even these verses had the things to do, the actions to do because of your faith. Are you living and telling others about the love that you have through Jesus Christ? Are you being His hands and feet? Are you denying yourself and taking up your cross? wasn't meant to be easy. Jesus said, why would you be surprised if you suffer and are persecuted for following me? Because I am persecuted and suffering even unto death. And I do it willingly. What greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends? And that's exactly what Jesus called us to be. So if we go and continue to read in Luke chapter 1, we'll start in verse 39, because that's where we left off last week. It says, At that time, immediately after Gabriel left Mary, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. 
When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. The word there is skirtaho. I'll try to get it right, pronounce it best I can with my southern Greek. And it's <laughs> leaped here, but it's tied with joy. Don't believe me? Well, I'm going to show you here in just a minute as we read far further. An action that became because of the joy that a six, not month old baby, but a six month old fetus, however you want to say that, had. Because the Spirit of God was upon that baby, and that baby leaped for joy. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, if you notice that when the Spirit of God comes upon people, they speak, they proclaim God's Word. They're not silent about it. It's a gift to be shared with others. The salvation, the joy that we have, the Spirit that comes upon us and seals us as God's children was meant to be proclaimed to the world. So when the Spirit comes upon her, she proclaims. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Now, I don't know about you, but Mary was probably still confused. Even though she said, blessed, you know, blessed am I, and uh, may your words, Gabriel, be true, whatever the, the Lord has said, I am your servant. I'm paraphrasing there. But she knows she still had to be doubtful. She had to be fearful. She had to wonder, how in the world, what am I going to do? What is my husband thinking? What's the rest of the world thinking about me? I'm not equipped to do this. I'm just a young girl. But Elizabeth was given the words of God to console her and tell her about the love of God that had come upon her. She was given words to build up because the gifts of the Spirit, as we're studying in 1 Corinthians right now, are given to build up the body, to do Jesus' work, to be His hands and feet. Verse 43 but why? There's that total opposite, that doubt and insecurity. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? This is Elizabeth. Her doubts and failures. Her insecurities coming out. She's six months already long. She knows she's already said previously that her disgrace has been taken away from her. She's even seen her husband's mouth shut up, the priest, because he's quiet. He can't say a word. She's seen all these things coming true and she still questions. So they're there to build up one another. That's why Mary went to see Elizabeth. To say, wow, these things that are happening to us, we're here, we're, we're going to accept them. They're of God. We need to strengthen each other's faith. Catherine always says it, we're two or three are gathered together. We're called to be in relationships with one another because we have a relationship with God. Verse 44, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb, there's that word again, leaped for joy. And now we've got a second word, tying it to the first word. An action that comes because of the gift of the Spirit, which is joy, which you will never, ever experience without being a child of God because you have a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. Verse 45, Blessed is she who has believed, because that's where it comes from, that the Lord would fulfill His promise to her, and He will to you, and He will to everyone who believes in the name of Jesus. And Mary said this song, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices, we can put joy there, in God my Savior, for He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed many mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty." He has helped His servant Israel remember to be merciful. How could we ever learn to be merciful except it's revealed by the Spirit again? Mercy, the exact opposite of what we deserve. 
so that we can love even our enemies. I'm pointing at Merle because we always talk about that. How can you love your enemies? Because Christ loved us, because God loved us and sent His only Son. Oh, that we deserved completely the opposite, that we were the enemies of the cross. Who are we except recipients of God's mercy and grace through Jesus Christ our Lord? So that we can love even our enemies. He has lifted, I mean, excuse me, He has filled the hungry with good things. Now we've got the opposite of what we had before, but sent the rich away empty. The words are transversed there. He has helped His servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as He, God, has promised our ancestors promises us today, promises all men who will receive Jesus Christ that God is faithful, He is loving and kind. He will also judge and He will hand out His judgment. He is the one that will do it, not us. We've called to love, to present the gospel message to be tied together with unity and mercy. All these things through the Spirit of God who is given to each one of us so that we can build up the body and proclaim the Word of Jesus Christ to the world. What a blessing to read this at Christmas. To know it's all about God and we have the privilege to be a part of this wonderful, glorious, foolish to the world plan, but it is the power of God to salvation for those who believe. In Matthew 11, verses 2 through 5, we read this. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now that seems strange, doesn't it? As a six-month-old fetus, he leaped for joy. And now as a man facing the dilemmas, the doubts, and in the insecurities of life, says... Could Jesus really be the one? Now let me remind you also, he heard a verbal voice from heaven saying, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. He saw the miracles performed by Jesus. And yet there were still doubts and insecurities from which Jesus says that this has been the greatest prophet of all times because he gets to proclaim the coming of the Messiah. And yet this individual still doubts. <laughs> kind of makes me think that all my doubts and insecurities don't mean as much. That I know my God is faithful. Paul says, like I said, why do I continue to do the things that I choose not to do? We still fight a battle. But we have victory in Jesus Christ. Period. So when we feel defeated, when we feel let down, hopefully there's a brother or sister there to encourage us, especially at Christmas time just like Mary was with Elizabeth. And hopefully we remember the promises of God. That why in the world would He send His Son and not follow through with every other promise written in His Word? That's what would be foolish for God to change His mind. Instead, He loves us beyond measure. So it goes on to say here, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Just as it was written in Isaiah that we read when we started this out in Isaiah chapter 40. God is faithful. Will you let Him lead you? Do you have the joy of Jesus? And if you do, are you rejoicing and leaping for joy? The choice is up to you, whether you follow Him or not, whether you believe and whether you let your life be a living sacrifice to Him, wholly acceptable and pleasing to Him, which is your reasonable, logical... <laughs> I forgot what the one translation said, but it was like, it just makes sense that that's your proper service. There's one more time that that word ski, ski, ski ta, tahoe, try to get it out, is used... 
Only one more time in Scripture. It's used three times. Twice by John leaping for joy. And a third time when Jesus says this in Luke 6.23. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. What is Jesus talking about? The day that He comes back? Nope. He's talking about the day that you're persecuted for your belief in Him. Read the chapter. He's saying great is your joy that you have to take up a cross. Your instrument of persecution and suffering. We don't look at it that way. We say, why me, Lord? And then we start doubting. That's exactly what John did when he was in prison. Because he couldn't understand that this in there, even though he said, I must become less so that you can be, so Christ can become more. We start poor, poor, pitifling ourselves. Jesus is saying, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. Nothing can compare. No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor thought has processed what God has in store for those who love Him. What a wonderful, merry Christmas we can have to rest in the peace of Jesus Christ, to rest in His joy, to love one another because we have been born again by the blood of the Lamb. So I want to ask you a question. Are you ready to rejoice? Are you ready, Logan? We've got a closing song called Joy of the Lord. It's a little different than what you've heard before. And Debbie and I are going to try to lead you in it. So stand up and rejoice.